Please, everyone, come on in and have a seat. Um, grab some lunch. My name is Lucia Alais, Alain, you can say it whichever way. I'm the director of the Buell Center. Uh, welcome to the fourth in our series of Conversations on Architecture and Land in the Americas, renamed Conversations on Architecture and Land in and out of the Americas to make sure we expand our geographic climes. Um, it's the first one of this semester, it's the first one in person as well as remote. So, welcome and thank you for making this space sort of be alive again. Um, the next one is next week at this time, also lunch. Uh, so keep track of that, make sure you um, can attend. Um, I'll just say a few words about our theme, which is architecture and land in the Americas. Um, one of the, it's, it's been the subject, not only of this uh, ongoing research, uh, ongoing uh, public series of conversations, but also of an ongoing research project with uh, graduates and postgraduate scholars um, at the Buell. And it's motivated essentially by one assumption. We've noticed that one of the assumptions that underlies how building culture is described in the Anglo-American context, uh, but just generally in architectural discourse today, one of the assumptions motivating this mostly is that land precedes architecture, that land is something that comes before building. And there are many reasons for this, of course, and I won't get into them now, but our research project and also this series of conversations is aimed directly against this assumption. We, our hypothesis is that um, land is not something that comes before building, but rather that buildings participate in the setting of expectations, in the crystallization of economic relations, of material relations that allow land to come into being as such in the West, um, as an asset, something to be settled, something to be objectified, etc. So there's no better place to find evidence for this uh, counterclaim than the soil beneath our feet. Um, beneath our feet, not our literal feet, although you know, a few floors down, uh, past the French Maison Française, um, there's about a hundred foot thick layer, ubiquitous, of soil, which is also a material record of about 200 years worth of uh, relations between social ecologies and the built environment and the natural environment. So um, this is what we are going to look at and discuss today, and we've brought a very exciting interdisciplinary group of people um, to discuss it. But before I turn the floor over to Cassie to sort of host this, I just wanted to you know, do justice to the architectural legacy, let's say. Um, there's a long history of architects being fascinated with what they call the soil and what they call geology, the sort of um, organicist theories of architectural form, which we are still dealing with today were motivated by people like to take an obvious example, Eugène Emmanuel Le Vieux Le Duc or John Ruskin. You can choose your favorite 19th century or unfavorite 19th century organicist <laughs> um, who thought that there were lessons to be drawn from the soil, from what they call the soil. And, and of course, the lessons all were always drawn very geometrically, very regularly, prismatically, tectonically. And so, of course, these are easy for us to critique and to see the kind of naivete of their deep desire to draw monolithic architectural lessons and to kind of monumentalize the land. But I'm showing you these images in part because although we no longer have inherited, hopefully, the organicist social assumptions that they make, still the desire for architecture to treat soil as just a thing, to treat soil as like a homogenous substance is there. So even today, when we know that it's not geometry that motivates the soil, it's depletion that shapes the earth, we know that it's not natural history, but it's sort of soil chemistry that is kind of everywhere on everybody's syllabus in architecture schools these days. Um, we know that it's digging and filling that are providing the kind of suggestive gesture that all the <coughs> architects designing landform buildings are looking to. Um, still, we are not immune from this desire to treat soil as a thing, an object, not as a set of and a record of social relations. So this conversation, I'm very happy to say is aimed to re-educate us <laughs> and uh, to complicate this view. And for this, I have um, my co-conspirator is Cassie Fennell, a colleague, friend, and a uh, long time, or I guess, important board member for the Bureau. So Cassie, I've asked to kind of help me put together this conversation. I'm going to hand it over to her, but first I have to introduce you. <laughs> Cassie's right here. Uh, Cassie is an urban anthropologist. Uh, her work examines how the social and material legacies of 20th century urbanism and shape the politics of social difference and of collective obligation and of belonging and of desire, if I can say that. Um, her first book was called Last Project Standing. It's a fantastic book. It won a prize. 
the book prize from the Association of Political and Legal Anthropology. And her writing combines classic uh, you know, anthropology and ethnographic study, but also readings of anthropological theory. Um, and she's especially interested, and this is what has come out in the conversation that we've had that I found so um, fascinating. She's especially interested in the way that sensory and affective qualities of everyday life cultivate people's attachment to places. And so although it's a very, um, let's say, sociologically, anthropologically sophisticated theory, it often has very sophisticated theories of the built environment as well. So, Cassie, please um, take it away. I'm going to remove myself and this chair from the Zoom of you. Uh, please uh, help me um, welcome Cassie and the panel. So I thank you, Lucia, for nudging me to the panel. And I also want to thank Jordan and Jacob, who managed to pull up everything perfectly. Everything they touch is turns to gold. So I feel really lucky to be in their orbit. And I also want to thank the panelists for coming to this conversation, being game to talk to everyone about their work, which I'm really excited about. So I have to confess that when Lucia asked me to think about pulling together and moderating a panel, you know, last spring on the theme of land, I thought you have the wrong person. Um, do you have the wrong person? You know, I'm an anthropologist of housing. I think about the anthropology of the house and I work in the late industrial US Midwest where I've been used to taking the ground like, like my interlocutors for granted, right? Um, is something that people build houses on for me, right? A straightforward natural support on which humans raise all manner of homes or households. And through those structures, all manner of binding social, political, and economic orders, right, and values. Okay, so this would be the classic kind of household study rendering of the ground. And yet that vision is um, short-sighted, um, if not utterly ahistorical, right? And it is increasingly impossible to hold on to for reasons that are intellectual and practical, right? The two reasons. Right. So the intellectual reasons, people are probably quite familiar with them. Over the past two to three decades, social theorists in the American Academy and beyond have engaged in this long project to refuse the ways um, uh, uh, of understanding the world that we inhabit, right? And, and specifically to refuse the ways that it's been you know, divided into two broad realms. The first, this should be familiar with the realm of human knowledge, intention, agency, and the second would be the realm of matter upon which humans exercise that agency, attention, uh, experimentation, right? So we've seen this paradigm shifting work within social theory, and that has asked us to re-examine various ontological divides that we subscribe to, but also, and this is just as important, the risks and the injustices of clinging to those ontologies. But I think there's also a very practical reason for us to, review, to refuse a vision that would treat the ground as just another vehicle for human desire, value, or agency. And that would be simply for the reason that people are preoccupied with it in their everyday lives, right? So practitioners like people in this room and the people you will become are on the Zoom, but also just regular everyday people are preoccupied with the ground, right? They always are, right? People want to know what is in it. They want to know what kinds of plants or other biotic forms it could support or support better. Um, they want to know whether or not or when, just increasingly when, is going to flood or dip or quake or sink or explode, right? And if and really when that happens, uh, what such a natural disaster is going to cost, right? And who is going to pay for it, right? In short, as much as people take the ground for granted, we also really don't take it for granted, right? So none of these are new questions, right? For instance, you don't get the rise of and the wealth of a city like Amsterdam or the reach of it, or even uh, for that matter, the reach and the rise of the place we now call New Amsterdam without lots of people spending time thinking and working the ground, right? Looking at the soil, asking what it is, filling it in, uh, amending it, right? Appropriating it, telling certain stories and not others about that appropriation, right? We stand on that history very much and that history has not, is, that has not receded below the surface. Um, and yet questions of the ground, its past and its futures feel newly sharp right now. Um, perhaps I didn't realize that soil is on the syllabi. That's really interesting. Um, it's on your syllabi, right? And that's really <laughs> interesting too. Um, and maybe there are reasons for that, right? Um, it seems that there are possibly two possibilities that make that feel urgent, right? First, humans are staring down the possibility that our past and ongoing actions may have radically altered the capacity for vital forms, including those that adhere in the ground itself, to thrive, right? And second, right, 
It's possible that we're staring down the possibility that those effects of those alterations have been unevenly and unfairly distributed. Okay, so this is perhaps why we're getting a conversation. I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear what you think about it. Um, I will just say that you know, I'm a little disingenuous. I, I come to this question because my interlocutors are preoccupied with the vacant lots that they acquire or occupy or seize. Um, and this is in places like the late industrial Midwest in Chicago on the west side of Chicago. It's not specific to Chicago, right? In these high demolition areas, which there have been decades of demolition that we have to understand as an effect of racism, right? Um, the general policy was simply to fold the building. It's not allowed anymore, but it still happens to fold the building into the foundation and then cover it up. And so what you get is kind of this concave surfaces. And you see this in Chicago, you see this in Detroit, you see this in Cleveland, you see this in St. Louis, you see this in Philadelphia where I'm from, right? Um, and people engage this space, right? Some of my interlocutors like to think of these residential lots as the prairie, and there's a reason for that, right? They have these lush kind of overgrowths, they have these brilliant wildflowers and these waving grasses, and it feels like reading the Burnham plan, right? And you like, oh wow, 1909, right? Except, right, this is not the little house on the prairie, right? It is also the case that as people spend time in these spaces, they do notice that various things will emerge, right? And that can be everything from marbles and bottles to slag, right? To appliances, to paint chips, right? And so they, you know, ask, what should I make of and with my vacant lot that is the house underfoot? What should we make of and with this? I have to say, I don't know the answer to that. But if I were going to craft an answer, I'd want the people at this table to help me understand. And so that is why they are here to help us understand these matters, right? That again, exceed the spaces in which I work and seem to, you know, permeate a lot of our imaginations right now. Um, so I'll introduce them, right? Linda is coming to us as a design principal for JGMA, where she has worked on everything from community-driven spaces and installations to civic institutions and universities, right? That's how we met talking about yeah. these things. <laughs> um, she has also practiced in Guadalajara and in Chicago, and she has a special interest in creating democratic spaces that attend to the intersectionality of feminism and racism. She holds many degrees um, in architecture and project management from the Tech de Monterey and Northwestern University and an honorary doctorate from Columbia College in Chicago. Right? But we should give you one too, right? While you're here. <laughs> <laughs> home, right? Um, Seth Dennison is joining us. Uh, he is an assistant professor at the Sam Fox School of Design and Visual Arts at Washington University in St. Louis. He's a researcher and designer trained in landscape architecture and human geography. And the work is multidisciplinary in nature, addresses art and design, soil science, urban geography in a very lovely and beautiful seamless way. And you have been the recipient of an SLM Foundation Research Prize, which I guess is a big deal in architecture, right? And also the Princeton Fellowship in Architecture, Urbanism, and Humanities, which is a big deal right, in the world of, of academic architecture. And you are currently working on finishing a book called Thinking Through Soil for Harvard Design Press. And I'm really very excited to read it. And so finally, we have Vanessa Agar Jones, my colleague, who is an assistant professor of anthropology here at Columbia University, where she is also has these firm feet planted in the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies, um, the Institute for Study of Sexuality and Gender, and the Center for Science and Society. And this is why you're going on leave next term. That's right. Right. <laughs> so that is most expensive. Uh, uh, Vanessa's work asks how coloniality is made and rendered material, right? And in social forms, in human and non-human bodies, and in the landscapes um, that we have inherited right, through, through coloniality. So with a focus on Black life in the Atlantic world, she conducts historical and ethnographic research on racialization, environmental degradation, and the politics of gender and sexuality. And she's also right, the chair of the Board of Directors of Land to Learn, which is a Hudson Valley-based organization that teaches uh, issues around food justice and community wellness through garden-based education. And I hope that all of you can join me in welcoming them coming to this room. Similar to Casey and Lucia, I was like, when Casey invited me, it's like, are you sure? <laughs> um, so I'm, an, I'm a practice architect in Chicago. So most of my work is dedicated to civic and education, as Casey mentioned. So I'm... Um, JGMA is a small firm in Chicago, but not small, right? um, we're like a medium firm and we're dedicated mostly to build um, education and culture and non-for-profit um, organiz with organizations 
in the southwest of Chicago. From there, there is there has been some like opportunities outside that that we are, but we that's our focus and that's where we want to stay. So as Casey said, um, the Chicago area and the southwest of Chicago, there is a lot of vacant land and there's a lot of demolition and there's a lot of segregation that has happened through the years. So when we approach a project um, as a practicing architect or it's like a, so we have so we have these organizations and there is already the budgets coming in where we have an owner's rep and all of those things that kind of align when you build the building um so we're like we're totally out of the theory and then we're like just emerging like what's the program what are the needs of, of, our, of our people or the people that is in the room but also we have to align with budgets things like that um so i I'm, i have like two pro like three projects right now so one is um, Columbia College, uh, the student center, uh, that project I did with a, my previous firm, Gensler. But the interesting piece about this one is like, it's um, south of the downtown Chicago. Um, so that project, when we come into it, it was like very interesting having the space of that, but it was like completely empty. There was nothing there when we came in. There were just a couple of things that we had to demo. But as we start like looking into the site, you never think about what's in the ground. Like that is never the first. Proposal. Like, it's like, okay, have this like empty piece of land, what are we going to do with it? So you engage with the structural engineer and then all of your other engineers and you start to design the program. In. And then along that way, you start like engaging with the geotechnical engineer. Most of the time, the geotechnical engineer is not part of our services, it's part of the owner services. Mm -hmm. So which it, in addition takes like another layer into that area, which is like how, like we're interacting with this like consultant that is not under our contract. So like how do we talk to them? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that came about for the Columbia College was like, there is a ton of, um, so 60 feet below the ground, there is this like gigantic tunnel <laughs> that was built um, at the beginning of the, uh, at the end of 1800s, they built a series of tunnels for like um, some, um, some infrastructure, they never finish it. So it goes around the whole downtown area. And then in the middle of this thing, um, in 1991, they were doing some infrastructure projects and then they broke one of the dams near the Chicago River and they filled it the whole downtown area. Mm -hmm. So one of the tunnels is that. So then how do you approach then your building when you have this like diagonal tunnels, like, like I can show you the maps coming through this thing. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna backtrack it a little bit. So yeah, um, I'm JGMA. Um, that's what I, my firm in Chicago. Um, so just a little bit of a history of our of our firm, as I was saying. So we are uh, a rich, myth, mostly in the Midwest. Our fearless leader is Juan Gabriel Moreno, she's a Colombian architect that founded the firm in 2010. So we have a bunch of awards and accolades, but um, we're very proud of the community work that we've been doing. Um, so we are committed in the civic investment, the challenge of paradigm, paradigms, and then there is these projects are some of the projects that we work in. Um, so most of, so charter school in Chicago, um, this is NEIU, so this is a, a state university in downtown, and I'm sorry, it's not downtown, it's like a little bit west from downtown. And then this project is with the University of Chicago is um, some housing for artists. And then the one in the bottom is part of the Invest Southwest, which is a program for that um, the city of Chicago is developing now in vacant lots that we're like they're trying to bring and then kind of finish with the segregation. So there is um, a couple of projects that are interested. This is where we work. So you can see that we focus mostly on the south uh, and west of Chicago because that's where the Latino communities mostly live. Um, so that's where my projects start. Um, so this is what I was talking about, the state Chicago Columbia College. I just have a series of maps. Um, so you can see, as many of you know, probably not. <laughs> in 1871, there was a big fire in the Chicago area that like consumed the downtown area and most about. And then you can see sort of like the, the shade in gray that's where the Chicago fire happened and that the, the magenta dot is where the Columbia College um, student center was sitting. Um, this is a tunnel that I was talking to you about. You can see kind of like in the, in the dark lines, that's the tunnels. 
that were built in night. So this is a map from 1902. So we have one of those tunnels going through there. Um, so then we went into the Sandworth map and started like, looking into it. There is a lot of changes in the grid of Chicago that happened. So you can see that this lot, this is our lot for Columbia, had like a lot of houses, residential houses, and then there was a theater on the corner. Um, even the, the name of the street changed, which it took me a while when I was looking for the maps. Um, and then, then it became, in 1950, it became a parking area. They demoed some of the houses, so they started like, disappearing some of the original grids. And then now this is our lot. Um, and then some of the infrastructure there. So this is the maps that we have to look as we are developing the project. So like, where is the water, where is the gas? How do we attack it? Where is our entrance? Where is the water meter, the gas meter? All of those things. Um, this is a map, and you can see, uh, put my cursor here, that's where the tunnel goes. Mm -hmm. So just right in the middle in our, in our building. So how do we approach it? So we have to like talk to structural engineer, the geotechnical engineer. We have to set aside like a bunch of budget just to infill, because the city of Chicago now has it there. You have to infill those tunnels so that they don't get the floating situation again. And then over here, very interesting, I put like, this is from the geothermal report. Uh, this is our typical geothermal reports that we receive from the buildings. And it's like, you can see like fill deposit, Sealed down, wood, asphalt, miscellaneous material, loose, et cetera, fine sand. And this is like 20 feet below. Um, I love that he did it on like by hand. Um, I do have the other ones that are more like technical, but this is like lovely and how it goes. And then um, you can see the weather rock, you can see some of the clay and what happens. And it's just like, so how do you approach this? So Casey was asking, so how do you approach it? Like, well, we have the budget. You just like take three feet out, put a slab on top of it and build your building. Your concrete goes around the tunnel, you will fill it, but it's just budget situations. Um, this is how the building ends up being so all built. It's, it was well received. But in this building, I did not take into consideration much of the soil, except for that tunnel. Um, so I work in a couple of buildings after that, then I came back. So then I went from Gensler to JGMA, came back to JGMA a couple of years later, and now we're building uh, an innovation center for the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, it's a smaller building that the Columbia College won, but it's also interesting. So this building is um, located outside of the fire area. So you may think, well, it's then it's not that bad. It is. Um, <laughs> so this is the this is the blog in 1917. You can see there's a bunch of houses, residential houses, and typical typical of Chicago. There's the alley that goes in the back, and then the, the garages are on uh, on the alley. So then all the fronts of the houses are clear, and then there is a uh, in the corner of uh, of the street there is an imperial brass, and then a welding institute. So very manufacturer like. The other thing I want to mention is that there, you can see the train over there, the, the train, some of the train tracks, and then Congress that is just the street. Um, then 1950, there's a bunch of them when happen, parking lots appear, the houses are gone. Um, you can see the block there, it goes demo. And, and then by 1962, everything is gone. This is how it happens in Chicago, <laughs> in case you can talk more about that. I'm like, um, but this is 62. This is 1971. Um, this is the last sur survey that we have. But something interesting that happened is that this lot becomes a mall, a city mall. It has a grocery store on the side. And then the only thing that happens is that the expressway or the highway gets built at where Congress is. So it's like a 20 line expressway that goes through um, for next East West in Chicago. So that happens just right next to it. So that means that everything will flatten out and then it got depressed. So we didn't know what we were gonna find in here. Some of the street changed. So we found a bunch of things happening in there. So this is a geotechnical report. And again, you can see the red ones is all the infill uh, that's happening on the, so on the site. And what we did, after, so one of the things we found a gas line in the middle of our thing that connects 
Um, it's a three feet gas line that connects the two neighborhoods. So we cannot build on top of that. So we have to move the building and that whole thing. And then I talked to it and it's just a one story building. So we could do like a shallow foundation. But then when I went back to the geotechnical engineer, he's like, no way. You cannot do that because of the depth of the fill. Like all of that is just houses on top of houses. So we couldn't do any of that. So we had to like do deep foundations, even in a one story building that has no weight. Um, and go all the way to the ground to, to find like um, stone. Um, so this is how the building would look. You can see the highway there, sort of thing. Um, so it, it used to be a residential neighborhood, like a typical Chicago grid, and now it's gone. And then you can see like the mall now it has come, like now it's a part of the of UIC, the campus there, and you can see UIC campus to the to the south. Um, we're in the midst of building this building, so hopefully it can break around next year. And then the last piece, and I'm sorry if I'm taking too much time, you tell me, um, is I, um, our firm was part of like the production for the biennial, for the Chicago Biennial last year. Um, so we did a couple of interesting things with them. Um, we were not in charge of the projects by any means. Um, so we were, they're just coming to us to help kind of with the permit process and how they can do it. So the first one, and this is the one that um, Casey got, like how we got connected is Soil Lab, um, which is a group from Europe. And then they were trying to do some um, installations with soil. They were in their, in their minds, they were thinking that they could come over, dig the ground, put it in a kiln and put some bricks on there. And I kind of laughed. Because <laughs> um, it's impossible, you cannot do that. This soil is contaminated. It's the west side of Chicago is down there, so you, there is no way you can touch that. You can see the site how it's destroyed, and how Casey was saying about um, some of like the the urban remains and some of the foundations are there. Um, so they they I connected them with a soil person, and then they found soil from they import soil from soil <coughs> other places, so they could not use it over here. Um, this is Bitter Tank, which is another of the installations. So they wanted to build like this 50 feet holes in the air and there's needed a foundation. I'm like, yeah, you're not doing any foundations on the side without any testing of the geotechnical. You need to test it, phase one, phase two, whatever all that means. So we had to like improvise and kind of figure out how not to touch the soil, mm -hmm. uh, dig around. And this is my kid going around and some of the pieces as they go. But and so they have done a fantastic job in, in that law, uh, but they have done it all on top of the existing uh, pieces there. Um, this is another project that is it's, um, for a girl grader in Goodwood. It is a very interesting project that they're doing. So they wanted to build a pavilion here for the, for the, for the community in Inglewood, which is one of the, um, the neighborhoods that have been the, have had the most disinvestment through the years. It's a it's a neighborhood to the south of Chicago. Um, so they they the city gave them this lot, but they couldn't dig around. So what they did is some gavions and they fill it with wood chips. That's how they attack the soil. Like they don't touch the soil because it's a manufacturing area. So they just like build like three feet of wood chips. But what does that mean for a pavilion is that our pavilion cannot have anything, any foundation. So yeah, when Chicago, anything. Um, so there was a lot of work that had to be done to like put these pieces out there. Also a lot of work with the zoning department because they don't want you to do urban gardening because of the contamination of the soil. So we had to like do some of this. Stuff there. They already had some of these um, beds over there. Um, and this is just organizations that we work. So no, I cannot take any credit for this. Um, I just have them to kind of put it together. And then this is a, the third project, which is under the grid. So again, it's just like this lot that is empty. They have painted some of this, but it's capped with asphalt. So it's going to stay capped forever until somebody wants to do something with it, but they will have to remedy the soil. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much for, for inviting me here. I'm super thrilled to be a part of this conversation. Um, and um, what, what I'm gonna do um, today is to start um, by showing you uh, one soil that I wanna kind of 
maybe ask you to help me think through something that maybe we can discuss. Um, and I'm gonna sort of start out by explaining a bit about that soil um, and then kind of go through how we were sort of working through and interpreting um, that soil through a series of fancy images. <laughs> 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 um, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. That's, that's the plan. Um, so this is the soil that I wanna sort of try to think through with you guys today. This is um, a farm field um, in this image, it's being um, irrigated by flood irrigation um, with urban wastewater. And this particular soil has been irrigated with um, urban wastewater for longer than any other soil in the world. So um, between like 70 and 100 years. And all of the wastewater that's irrigating that soil comes from here, comes from Mexico City. So all of Mexico City's wastewater stormwater runoff, industrial runoff, raw sewage, goes through a pipe 60 kilometers and arrives at that field, right, untreated, at a rate of 60 cubic meters a second, right? Um, and, you know, the first place it arrives when it gets to this valley is this kind of verdant, green, beautiful uh, valley, um, which is um, uh, also the world's largest uh, sewage reservoir. And for the farmers in this area, in the Valle of Mesquital, um, this wastewater represents a kind of enormous free subsidy, right? It makes possible um, their farming uh, three crops a year. They don't need to buy additional fertilizer. Um, and, you know, for, for these farmers, the wastewater is a kind of miracle. It makes life possible in the Mesquital. And although there are health risks associated with the wastewater, of course, as you know, poverty has its own health risks. Um, and the wastewater has also made this valley a kind of breadbasket for Mexico City as well, um, providing um, uh, staple crops like corn and also um, a lot of alfalfa, which then goes to, to livestock. Um, and so, but of course, you know, as you can imagine, there are some problems with this, right? Um, so flooding the valley with such a massive quantity of untreated wastewater um, causes the soils to accumulate heavy metals, pathogens, parasites, uh, surfactants, antibiotics, pharmaceuticals carried in the wastewater, um, which you can sort of see here in these kind of strangely persistent and eerily white uh, foams that accumulate on irrigation canals. And there's some other like really strange properties of the water as well. So like many of these irrigation canals that you're seeing here as they get smaller and smaller, wouldn't pass a federal drug test for cocaine and also contain <laughs> some of the highest surface water concentrations of the diabetes drug metformin, uh, which is commonly prescribed in Mexico City. One of these very strange uh, moments in which NAFTA sort of kind of creates the own geophysical conditions for its own existence. And from the government's perspective, um, the pathogens in the wastewater represent an unacceptable health risk, right? Um, and in 2017, a new sort of billion dollar wastewater tre treatment plant came online um, to treat uh, roughly 30% of Mexico City's effluent. That would also be the kind of 30% that they sent to the farmers, right? So you would think that this is like a moment of celebration, right? Finally, a giant wastewater treatment plant to treat all this contaminated water. And part of our project kind of begins with the fascination with how this actually became a crisis for the valley. Um, this is an image of uh, a few thousand farmers uh, protesting the wastewater treatment plant, physically blocking the entrance, um, occupying uh, the treatment plant, preventing any of its employees from entering or leaving. Um, and you know, so really from the farmer's perspective, uh, the treatment plant was not actually a triumph of public health at all, uh, but it was rather a kind of tragedy. Um, it would impoverish them, they felt, um, and that, you know, also that they had been living and working in these dirty soils for a century and over many generations learned the really hard won knowledge of um, figuring out how to manage these health risks. Um, and by building the treatment plant, the government was sort of disavowing that knowledge uh, and worse, um, transforming the delicate soil chemistry of the valley in ways that the farmers claimed, the government did not fully understand what they were doing. Um, 
So in, in some sense, our project begins with this question about this soil, like whose version of this soil is correct? Um, which image of this soil um, uh, is right, for lack of a better term? Um, and, you know, unfortunately, one of the things that we found is, is this sort of um, soil taxonomy um, is actually kind of very little help here. You would think if you wanted to know what a soil is, you would ask soil taxonomy, and it's actually kind of um, not a great way to go. I mean, in some sense, the, the vast taxonomic project of surveying the world's soils, which works by identifying patterns in the formation of horizons and connecting these patterns to soil properties, is what determines the hierarchy of meaning in a soil profile, right? And it's really this kind of beautiful and elaborate um, collective agreement um, of, you know, for how each individual morphological property of a soil profile contributes to the, over, um, to the, to the over, overarching identity of the soil as a thing that we can sort of name and identify. But the problem for us here in the Mesquital Valley is that this system excludes the possibility that these properties might have a human origin. Um, and, you know, soil taxonomy sort of historically has been the study and classification of natural soils whose histories are also natural histories. And this means that even if we wanted to strictly follow taxonomic conventions for representing these soils, we would not actually be able to, right? Um, as soils formed in the effluent of 22 million people, and the geomorphology of the arid Mexican altiplano, they have no name whatsoever in the system of soil taxonomy, right? Which does not recognize pharmaceuticals, pathogens, or industrial waste as relevant for taxonomic purposes. So if these soils have no name, um, then this means there's really no system by which we could objectively decide which soil properties matter more than others. And as we've seen, this has like, you know, a lot of consequences in the Mesquital because these properties are in fact relevant to the people who live there. For the farmers, it's the organic matter which defines the identity of the soil, right? For the government, it's the pathogens. And for soil taxonomy, it's neither, right? So again, we could kind of run up against this question of whose image of the soil is more compelling. And so in order to address this question, I want to kind of introduce a sort of critique of what, you know, I might think of as like the concept of agency in a soil and sort of clarify how our research sort of proceeded from this basic political impasse. And, and to do this, I want to kind of consider this image, which we became kind of obsessed with in, in our project. We literally, you know, we kind of show this image too much. Um, and we're obsessed with it because, so let me first tell you what you're looking at. So um, these are like two 17th century illustrations of a stinging nettle in Mexico. And the illustration on the left is from uh, the Codex de la Cruz Badiano. So that's um, the oldest extant medicinal in the Americas it's from 1552. It was drawn just 25 years before the illustration on the right by two um, indigenous authors in Mexico City, not far from the Valle de Mezquital. Um, and, you know, so what's crucial about this image for us um, is that, you know, in some sense, both of these images were drawn for medicinal purposes. Both of these images were drawn in order to show some kind of relationship between the plant and health. But of course, um, one image, in one image, there's something sort of conspicuously absent, right, which is the soil, right, drawn at the base of this, of this plant. Um, and, you know, the inclusion of soil in the illustration on the left wasn't accidental in this regard, right? The basic implicit claim is that in order to find this particular plant with this particular medicinal properties, you do have to actually know something about the soil that it's growing in, right? In the image on the right, we have um, uh, kind of an image that's become our sort of common sense representation of plants, right, in the West, which is that the soil has been removed from the plant body, um, and in this particular case, it was done so really in the service of the project of imperial botany in order to extract pharmaceutical knowledge from the Americas, physically deterritorializing both the plant and plant knowledge from the soil. So the omission of soil, which appears to us now as a kind of common sense in the representation of plants, um, is also you know, no accident, I think, and as you've sort of already been discussing here in your series on land in the Americas, 
um, it's a kind of omission that's necessary to the fundamental conception of freedom and property that underwrote colonization, right? I think this is a conversation you guys have been having. So in this sense, just from this image of um, Edizi Castle, which is the stinging nettle in Mexico, for us, we can start, sort of start to see the moment that we lost the ability to understand the soil in the Mesquita. And part of what we've been trying to do in this, in the sort of thinking through soil project is to sort of reassemble an image of the soil that hasn't sort of um, been irradiated by the concept of nature and its natural histories. So in other words, we're sort of interested in seeing social relations in the soil by mapping the living and non-living forces that produce agency out of their intersectionality in um, soil, bo soil bodies. Um, and I think intersectionality is kind of um, uh, an important term uh, for us. Uh, some of our most trusted guides in this work <laughs> have been feminist materialist critiques of nature from scholars like Karen Barad and, and Judith Butler and Rosemary Joyce and um, Catherine Yusoff. Um, but then also some of our most trusted guides were Vanessa, whose work we read very carefully um, over the course of the week as we were trying to think about how to respond to this project. We, um, this, was, this was something that was actually critical to the, to, the, to the work that we were doing and trying to think about. And I think as you know, the parallels between the soil in the Mesquital and the soil in Martinique, maybe if some of you are familiar with the work, you'll be, you'll be putting those kinds of things together, but some really similar problems. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think, I think um, for us, what those feminist materialist critiques of nature really helped us think about was the way um, that um, one of the problems with trying to arbitrate environmental justice struggles like the one in the Mesquital um, is that we always kind of want clear causality. Um, we want accounts that say, this does this, right? But I mean, as, as we've kind of seen, because that's how we hold people accountable. That's, that's actually the tool that we use to hold people accountable, right? But as we've seen in the Mesquital, sometimes it's not actually that simple. And if agency is produced intersectionally through sort of, as Karen Brad would say, matter in interaction, then what the soil does actually depends, right? Um, so in many ways, we've been trying to do drawings of soil <laughs> that show what the soil depends on, right? In other words, all the things that produce agency in the soil intersectional, because what soil is or what soil does like produce you know, toxicity or fertility or disease actually depends on other conditions like medical practices in Mexico City or the use of rubber boots by farmers in the Mesquital or the North American Free Trade Agreement um, that's producing the diabetes that's producing the soils with diabetes medication, um, you know, or even um, the sort of racist standards of beauty that put mercury-based skin whitening creams in the waste stream that goes to these soils, right? And this all contributes in, um, you know, really meaningful ways to the soil chemistry of the Mesquital Valley. It's not sort of some kind of um, uh, anecdotal oddity. It, it actually makes a lot of difference. Um, and in this sense, we can't think of the soil as simply formed from sort of cations and clay surfaces. We have to think of it um, as um, a process of soil formation that are shaped by the bodies and urban life of um, uh, Mexico City's residents and even generations of its residents. And I'll just give you one more sort of example. Um, through our uh, project to map agency in the soils of the Mesquital, we also sort of discovered that even the simple medical choice between taking the antibiotic sulfamethoxazole or ciprofloxin in Mexico City has profound implications in the soil of the Mesquital because one of the medications actually has a half-life in this specific soil that is far shorter than the others. Um, so antibiotics that arrive in the wastewater bind to clay surfaces in the soil and remain active until they break down. Um, and these low level concentrations make excellent conditions for the evolution of antibiotic resistance. So today it's actually quite easy to find uh, bacteria in the soils of the mesquital with multi-drug resistance. And you know, most of these bacteria with multi-drug resistance are totally harmless. Um, but of course, <clears throat> the worry is that something less harmless will evolve um, through the exchange of resistance genes um, in the soil. And I say, you know, our project discovered this, but what I what I really should say is that we read the work of Christina Siba, who's an incredible soil scientist uh, working 
in the Mezquital um, at the uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico. Um, and you know, without these people doing this kind of work, we're totally blind, right? So uh, um, her work is absolutely fundamental to the, to the project. Um, and you know, our drawings took on a sort of similar archival quality, right? If the soil in the Mezquital has become a kind of library, a sort of lending library of genes uh, in plasmids, um, our drawings took on a sort of similar kind of archival quality. Instead of sort of thinking about these drawings as maybe finished or static images, we started to think of each of our soil profiles um, as itself a kind of repository of information, collecting different processes at different scales, the key sort of agential moments, um, like the production of disease or antibiotic resistance or wealth or debt, right? Which we don't often think of as a soil property. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, crucially, trying to show the production of that sort of agential moment in all its contingency, I think, is also crucial to the project, right? Because crucially, it's really only at the moment that you can understand what something depends on that you can begin to imagine an alternative future. Um, and this is, you know, sort of the key to our project's analysis of the environmental justice struggle in the Mezquital. Um, in the end, you know, it's not really that... Um, one of these perspectives on the soil was right and the other one was wrong. Like, um, you know, was the government right about the soil or were the farmers right about the soil? Um, it was actually more about two completely different and conflicting visions for how we would depend or should depend on the soil in different ways in the future, right? Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's kind of an argument about how we should depend on the soil and what the soil should depend on. And those are radically different, those, those produce radically different futures in the Mezquital. Um, in other words, you know, two different forms of life that presuppose two different soils, right? Um, whose agency to produce the basis of these forms of life comes from radically different socio-ecological relationships. So um, for us, it's, it's been um, a, a process of also trying to connect um, the sort of claims that are being made about what the soil is to their sort of hidden implications for what the future should be. And that's sort of how we started to think about, about, about this particular soil, but I'll end it there and um, we can hopefully talk more. Great. Well, first, a tremendous thank you to the folks at the Buell Center for organizing this conversation, to Cassie for having the vision to bring all of us together, and to both Linda and Seth for this incredible work. I so appreciated listening to both of you and feel a little cowed to be going in your wake. Um, uh, and real gratitude to all of you for coming um, out in the middle of a beautiful day to sit in the room with us um, to hear us talk about soil. Um, I took very seriously Cassie's remit um, that we come to talk about the work that is already underway and not write something new. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the irons that I currently have in the fire, um, the two book projects kind of on my immediate horizon, uh, one of which uh, has a part called soil and the other of which kind of departs from uh, that section on soil to make some other claims and ask some other questions about how soil brings us into relation um, uh, toxically and otherwise. Um, so I'm going to talk about body burdens, which is the first project. Um, uh, and I've been working for what feels like an inordinately long time on <laughs> this book called Body Burdens, Toxic Endurance and Decolonial Design in the French Atlantic. And in it, I reframe the toxicological concept of body burden to account for the accretion of toxicities in Martinique, which is a French territory in the Caribbean located right between St. Lucia and Dominica. Um, it's focused on material exposures to an endocrine disrupting chemical called pipone or chlorodicone in French, and on largely immaterial exposures to things like racism, sexism, homo and transphobia. And Body Burdens asks how contemporary debates about um, sovereignty on the island are articulated through the prism of ideas about bodily porosity and chemical contamination. The book foregrounds Martinique's status as an incorporated French territory to highlight how islanders simultaneous identifications with the Americas where they are located, with the Caribbean where they are also located and with Europe where they are symbolically located, uh, generates political subjectivities and formations of desire that cross geographic and symbolic scales. 
And so decolonial desire in the title functions on two registers here. First is a reflection upon the meaning of decolonization in a context where political sovereignty is not the anticipated nor desired outcome. Sovereignty is not on the table. Um, and second, as a lens through which we might understand bitter contests over the etiology of same-sex desire and gender transgression in the African diaspora, often framed as colonial imposition. And so this is where the soil comes to matter. So in three sections called sand, soil, and sediment, I bring this ethnographic and archival research into conversation with theoretical questions about French coloniality, about archives of same-sex desire and gender transgression, about pesticide contamination, and the stories of endocrine disrupting chemicals compel us to tell, and about the persistence of the material and immaterial afterlives of the plantation. Um, uh, so through my attention to everyday life, I argue that body burdens reveal particular vulnerabilities as well as contradictory assemblages of power in post-slavery societies. And I argue too that those burdens offer us a site at which we might imagine a redistribution of their effects, an embodied site to enact a radical vision of repair. So my focus on sand is about evidence, archives, and presence. Soil is about etiology, toxicity, and harm. And sediment about reshuffling the stuff of the world as it accumulates and settles, but also as it, as it is sometimes erupted and refigured. Volcanoes come up quite a lot in this text um, because like many islands in the region, Martinique is born of a volcanic eruption. Um, Barbados is the outlier of the coral island um, in the archipelago. Um, uh, sand, soil, and sediment have pushed me to embrace Omisha Eke Tensley's challenge that we find new metaphors and that they must be material as a beacon in my own practice. Uh, Tinsley argues, following Franz Fenelon, that these kinds of metaphors provide conceptual bridges between the lived and the possible. And so I'm trying to think with her um, about the, the materiality of the metaphor, uh, the materiality of sand, soil, and sediment, and about how they work as metaphors, both in Caribbean literatures and in the stories that people are telling about their lives, their histories, and their futures. So um, sand. I'm just going to talk briefly about sand and briefly about sediment and then talk a little bit more fulsomely about what happens in soil. Um, so sand's two chapters are a scattered archive of same-sex desire and gender transgression on the island and building from a long tradition of thinking about the problem and the power of historical evidence for the Caribbean region, famous, famously called a region with an absence of ruins. Um, uh, I use sand as an analytic to track queer presences in Martinique via what I call empirical ephemera. This section expands upon the stories introduced in an earlier article called What the Sands Remember that I published in GLQ many years back. Um, the first story is of 19th century Saint Pierre, which was that era's Sodom of the Antilles, it was called as such. Um, and its destruction in a volcanic eruption in 1902. Saint Pierre was the capital of Martinique until the volcano erupted in 1902. And the second chapter is about 21st century Saint Anne, which is far on the other side of the island. It's the site of Martinique's most frequented gay beach. And together, these chapters assemble fragments of what could be called queer social worlds from erotic fiction, ethnographic engagement, and from the historical record, addressing the tensions between visibility and erasure for non-normatively gendered and same-sex desiring Martinicans. And I draw in this section from the vibrant literature on queer archives in conversation also with people working to theorize archives of Black, Atl Black Atlantic life. Um, plumbing the meaning of the Creole term en living under the leaf, I attend to agonized questions about evidence making, body counting, and queer burdens of proof as they are made manifest both in political contestation and in the island's landscape. I work to both manifest proof of presence and to critique the demand for it here, recognizing the power of historical evidence even as its quicksandness tied to technologies of visibility enact their own forms of violence. So I'm using sand to try to think through what it means to think same-sex desire and its ideology, to think gender transgression and its ideology um, on the island as related to the destruction of uh, Saint Pierre in 1902. When the volcano erupts, spews its magma, does its thing, right, destroys the city, and what you have in its wake are black sand beaches all along the west coast. 
um, of the island. And I make the argument that this, this uh, the black sand itself calls up an association with the city that once was, the Sodom keeps coming back um, as a presence on the island uh, because of its relationship to the volcanic eruption. People called it, you know, the destruction of the, the city of sin, essentially. Um, uh, so that is sand. Secondly, uh, the second part of the book is called Soil. Um, I have been meditating for a very long time on M.A. Césaire's um, invocation of Black life, uh, that we are walking compost, hideously promising tender cane and silky cotton. Um, and so in Soil, I'm thinking through emergent narratives about the origins of same-sex desire and gender transgression on the island. And one of the new stories um, that I begin to write about in Bodies in the System, that thank you, Seth, for reading, um, <laughs> is bodily exposure to an endocrine-disrupting pesticide used on Martinique's banana plantations in the late 20th century. And so this is Kipone or Floricone. And focusing on this Kipone or Floricone scandal as it exploded into the public sphere from 2009 to 2019 or so, this section attends to the ways that queer bodies become the proxy site for vexed conversations about the long durée of the plantation and contemporary Martinique in life. It's all, it always comes back um, to the plantation and its soils and what those mean for Black life on the island. I take readers both to Saint Marie, the center of the banana producing region, and the Chelcher, the site of the university, um, where I track not only the movement of the chemical through the isle, island soil and groundwater, so I'm talking to soil scientists on the island um, and the folks who are trying to make sense of the extent and the, and the depth of the contamination of the soil and groundwater by this particular chemical, synthetic chemical. I'm only attending to this one synthetic chemical. There are thousands of others to which I could be paying attention, but this is the one that I'm trying to work with and through. Uh, but also the circulation, I'm also trying to track the circulation of stories about queer ideology as they transform into their own forms of toxicity. What kind of toxic tales uh, do people begin to tell about where same-sex desire and gender transgression come from? So attending to the material endurance of sites of contamination, takes uh, more than 600 years for this compound to break down naturally in the environment. So this is a, an enduring site of contamination, as well as the immaterial endurance of cis heteronormativities. This section investigates the ways that the biological becomes the social and vice versa. I argue for an ethic of toxic apprehension that takes seriously the multiple forms of violence that accumulate in same-sex desiring and gender transgressing Martinican bodies. And I argue that these same people and their bodies bear a double burden. First, as a site for the accumulation of material and immaterial violence, and two, as proxy bodies that stand in for a host of agonized debates about enduring coloniality, and thus are the site of a particular genre of representational burden. Um, so Kimberly Bain reminds us that blackness and soil are mutual geographies of material and metaphoric extraction. And as Cesar too observes, our imbrication with the commodity worlds of the plantation has made the materiality of soil and our lives um, far more than metaphor. Um, and I'll say more about that in a moment. And finally, the last part of the book is called Sediment. Um, uh, Olive Senior, uh, gardening in the tropics is a beacon for me on this. Gardening in the tropics, you never know what you'll turn up quite often, bones. Um, and finally, Sediment's two chapters take on the palimpsestic quality of toxic accumulation, not just in people's bodies, but also in the land and in the landscape. And I end where I began with a volcanic eruption and with the ways that geologists on the island understand accretion and the endurance of material forms. Um, I find that these geologists write about sediments in ways not too different from humanist narratives about history and about archives. In their work, the stratigraphic layers of sediment and rock tell a story about location and about change over time. Edouard Glissant, another of the island's signal thinkers, opines that sediment begins first with the landscape in which your drama takes shape writing that it can be understood as a metaphor for aggregated identities and for an accretive politics that links people to the places from which they've come. And so sedimented through a particular set of movements of transnational capital, chloridicone or kipone, this pesticide, joins land and body into a politic of location, one that's not just preoccupied with romantic ideas of national belonging, soil and nation, but is about bodily material interaction. And looking to sediment, I argue, allows us to think almost forensically about the sources and the consequences of human and non-human entanglements in the body. 
And in my thinking about what the sediment record shows and about the accretive character of this violence, I focus on what accumulates in the spaces through which we move and in the spaces beneath our skin. Um, I think of all of this as the stuff of toxic endurance. Um, uh, I, I can say more about this, but Body Burdens is a book about evidence, it's about ideology, it's about how we think our future is based on how we understand our past. Um, it's about sand, it's about soil, it's about the sediment record on this island. Um, it's about Black folk in all of our differences on the island, sutured together, turned toward each other, but with colonial masters at our backs, as we reach for a language and a vision for what comes in the wake of our undisentanglable entanglement with coloniality, with the plantation, and with an anti-Black world. Um, and so that leads me to a newer project called The Synthetic Atlantic. So uh, Body Burdens is all about Martinique, um, though I take, some, uh, I take some liberty to tell the story of this compound as it moves from the US into the Caribbean. That story is held in abeyance until the newer project, The Synthetic Atlantic, where I take this story of soil and expand upon it following the transatlantic roots via soil contamination of this pesticide. I offer the overlay of Hopewell, Virginia in the 1970s, where this uh, pesticide was most um, abundantly produced um, and where there was a massive spill into the James River. Um, with Trinité Martinique, which is the site on the island where the pesticide has its most abundant distribution, um, in order to understand one dimension of the plantation's long afterlife and its relationship to what Michelle Murphy has called chemical infrastructures. Those infrastructures, Murphy explains, assemble the spatial and temporal distributions of industrially produced chemicals as they are produced and consumed and as they become mobile in the atmosphere, settle into landscapes, travel in waterways, leach from commodities, are regulated or not by states, are monitored by experts, are engineered by industries, are absorbed by bodies, and on and on and on. And for Kipone or Cordicone, its infrastructures unfold on a well-worn path along the routes laid down by the transatlantic slave trade and by the plantation-derived commodities that have long been at the heart of racial capitalism. In the United States, industrial chemical plants often came online on the former sites, on the sites of former plantations, as was the case in Hopewell, Virginia. Hopewell was called the chemical capital of the South, um, uh, the place uh, where you see the kind of former factory uh, is also the site of a, a massive former plantation complex um, and is now the site of a housing project. Um, <laughs> Globally, where crotacone came to be distribute, distributed, excuse me, the plantation link was even more direct with the insecticide coming to work on the bananas that replaced older investments in sugar cane, um, as was the case in Marseille. So racialized and gendered discourses about toxic exposure unfold across this trans-imperial Atlantic terrain. In Virginia, what, you'll, what you will have seen in the 1970s is that anxieties about reproduction by a concern about the impotence of exposed white workers came to stand in for a measure of the extent and consequences of the damage that this exposure had wrought. And in Martinique, a different set of narratives about thwarted reproduction emerged, both about impotence related to prostate cancer, the rates are very high in Martinique, um, and about the estrogenic effects of endocrine disrupting chemicals, which is part of the core of the soil section of the first project. Um, claims about the sexual and reproductive consequences of exposure via this, these soils are at the heart of concerns about chemical afterlives. And these in turn rely upon ideas about a natural body, its optimum health, and its natural gender, sexes, and sexualities. And though Virginia's and Martinique soils are linked by Cordicone's infrastructures, they are deeply differentiated by the severity and duration of chemical exposures, the interpretive frames mobilized to understand them, as well as by the possibilities for remediation and repair. And I love the ending of your reflections, uh, both of your reflections on this question of remediation and repair. These contexts and their reverberations surface the enduring entanglements of reproduction with structures of racial capitalism. Jody Melamed argues that racial capitalism is a technology of anti-relationality. And in terms of origins and intents, many of the dimensions of Cordicone's story resonates with this analysis. But Cordicone's reach into and across soils in the Americas reveal one, way, one vantage from which racial capitalism is also pro-relational in that it produces new kinds of largely unexpected kin, among them those of the chemical kind. 
Uh, for me, and this is a concept I've been working with, chemical kin describes the forms of affiliation that emerge and are deployed as this chemical makes its way into persons, places, and things, tracking the articulation of a narrative about contamination, accountability, and communities of chemical injury, inspired by the pesticide circulation in the bodies of people, both powerful and marginalized, both proximate and far flung. So I'm just trying, I'm trying to think uh, together, these, this kind of uh, trans temporally and kind of trans locally, this community of workers exposed to ketone as kin in many ways, the folks exposed to ketone or cortecone um, in Matsunique at a different moment um, in a different place. So, cortecone and its sedimentation in physical and social worlds helps us think in multi scalar terms about the coordinates for and consequences of our late industrial entanglements, ever embedded in their longer standing relationships to racial capitalism and colonial violence. The story stitched here is one of patchy phenomena defined as much by the inexorable movement of a chemical from factory to plantation, building to ground, as it is by human and non-human exposures. These scales of toxic apprehension present an opportunity to join up two strains of materialist analysis, I would argue. One that might be considered old by the commodity chain and the other new with its emphasis on matter and its agencies, the body's interaction with its environments, affect and the sensorium. And this apprehension also presents an ethical demand, the constitution of the toxic in our soils and in our bodies, its diagnosis and attribution has consequences for the past we conceive and for the futures we might hope to inhabit. We'll stop there. Thank you, everyone. This is so wonderful to hear these ideas together. Um, and to get a sense of the kind of wide, wide reach of the geography that you want us to keep in mind as we keep this, uh, on top of this question. Um, so I guess I wanted to start, I have a number of questions, but I thought one that would be really interesting to start with um, has to do with the kind of skepticism I hear right through all your, you know, your ideas, but also a kind of reaching for a different way to capture how soils are in right? So Linda, you were like, oh, I, this, is a, this is a report from the Geotex, here's the drawing, I love the drawing, right? So I would love to talk more about what it is, but the next thing you, the movement, you know, the kind of refusal of the kind of traditional ethnographic one place one time, the interview, the kind of observation, and you move between all these sorts of sexual um, traces, right? All these sorts of literary genres, all these different kinds, all the kind of confessions, right? These come from your work. So this is also kind of skepticism to a method that cannot capture this object, right? And with Seth, I see this too. You're kind, you're kind of, you know, where is the taxonomy for this, right? What is the appropriate taxonomy for it? Playful engagement with this by drawing this in, but I'm hoping that we can hear from you or just think more about why this kind of object, which is we're learning completely heterogeneous, not captured in in kind of a certain kind of classic science model, um, and not even represented um, in practice in a way that that compels you. What why reach or how reach for these different kinds of representational strategies or methodological strategies to apprehend this object? Why is it important for understanding how this thing we want to call soil brings us into relation. Good question. I've just been laughing too. <laughs> you can start. I don't, I, I'm kind I mean, of I guess what do you like about that drawing and why the drawing is, was so much more appealing to you um, than the kind of technical report? The... The, um, because it actually like breaks it down into like what it it feels like I don't know if I don't know if that makes sense um because the other one is just like very technical like it's just like this feel whatever that feel means but the other one has like there is feel there is wood there is pieces there is it has life when you put it by hand I don't know if that um that makes sense but when you talk to the engineer and talk about what it's in there they the we have this preconception that engineers sort of like kind of like pretty square, kind of <laughs> straight, direct. Then when they talk to them, when you, when you talk to a geotechnical engineer or a civil engineer, I was calling my civil engineer yesterday and telling him about, and he was just all excited talking about soil. <laughs> so if you ever get a civil engineer over here, well, I'm, I'm sure he will be happy to talk hours on how the soil and how it affects and we don't care about it. Mm -hmm. So when you actually like 
the geotechnical report is actually like a stack of papers like this that is very technical. But when you get into this drawing, it's, it gets a, like very simple to like, okay, it's simple. There is 10 feet of fill of like remains of houses and things. And then also when you started looking at the maps, um, so we we didn't look at the maps in the economic expert at the beginning because we didn't care about it, like mm -hmm. it was not in our minds mm -hmm. until we discovered that there was a ton of, so then that's when you started like, getting into it and understanding where it's coming from and why. And then, then you get the vein of like the passion of what was there um, and how to attack it. But none of the two projects actually um, think about what was there in the past. Mm -hmm. They just like, because they were empty canvases for many years after. So we just sit on them um, and try to fill them because that's the other thing about Chicago, that there's so many vacant lots that have been sitting empty for the longest time, either in downtown, in the West, the South, everywhere. So the fact that there is something happening on them is, is a matter of a celebration. Um, if it is either in the in the Columbia or the UIC or even in the in the Vienna ones that are more like um, those Vienna periods were very excited because they were like um, grassroots. Um, so then when you talk to the neighbors and everyone is like, how? What are you doing? So does that respond to that question? May I offer? I, I, one of the things I loved about that drawing, the hand drawn. <laughs> Um, image that I think connects really beautifully to what Seth and his team are up to is that it seemed to allow you to exceed the envelope of the site. I mean, for, I don't know if this is how you think of it when you look at that drawing, but it seems like it uh, it references a larger set of relations beyond the kind of the pink grid of the, yeah. the, the envelope of yeah. just for your um, project. Mm -hmm. And so something there's something kind of abundant and relational about the hand-drawn yeah. image that. It is, so the way the borings happen, that's the other thing that we decide where the borings go. Like mm -hmm. they comment, like where do you want the borings? So then you look at the map and then it's like, where are we putting this building? And this is most most of the time at the beginning of the project. So you don't know exactly what's gonna be your project. So you start like point, point, point. So um, the deal thing goes there and then just like gets it. And then, so what we're seeing is just this much of, actually test mm -hmm. of what's happening in there we do like four mm -hmm. and obviously if you want a fifth one it's just like um putting tea because it's money involved um other thing that so is going to be very interesting and, and talking about uic again that i am more interested in and so more and more is that we are trying to do now this um we're trying to be sustainable trying to save energy, conserve energy, and find different ways. So then in Chicago, the most economical, and most easy way to get um, energy is through the soil. So geothermal mm -hmm. systems that go 100 feet down the air, and then you do this. Um, so basically, it's just like a pipe, an inch and a half pipe that goes, and then you do like 40 of them, and then you, that's so you run water through them. That's how you do heating and ventilation. Um, so that's very interesting to understand that even your your daily power can come through, or like your not not your power, but your daily like heating and cooling can come through the air. Um, so the other test that I need to do, and I cannot find an engineer to do it, which is very strange. It's what is the energy load of that specific piece of so it of that. Um, so I need an engineer that goes drills, measures how what's the, the temperature of the soil down there, and then in that way I can reduce the amount of drilling that I have to do. I don't know, like that's very it's super technical, I get it, but um it has to do with the land and soil, how the land and soil has to, it gives you all these other possibilities, infiltration water, stormwater, energy, um, all of that, all that layer of things. Um. Yeah, and, and I think I think that um, is what's also so important about that also in relationship to this question of representation is to um, also realize that that drawing of soil that, that you show is not soil to an agronomist. 
Mm-hmm. Correct. Right? <laughs> yeah. so, it's land. <laughs> or, or, or it's uh, maybe some kind of possible future soil after a few thousand years. You mean because yeah. you can't grow anything on it? No, no, because, because it's actually not. So well, well for, first of all, an agronomist would only be interested in the first six feet. Anything under six feet is not relevant at all. Um, so f- all that whole section going down 60 feet, it's not soil. It's what's they, what they would call regular, right? So, you know, but then also it's not soil in, in the sense that um, it has no ability to support plant life. Maybe that would also be, but, but, but that's just to say that every discipline, I mean, soil is one of these materials that affects so many other disciplines, so many other kinds of things that people want to do that um, all these disciplines have different ways of representing the soil, right? Geotechnical engineers have these, I love these, these um, Casa Grande slump tests where they get the soil wet and then they like, <laughs> and it slumps. Yeah. And then that's a technical measurement. Yeah. That's how they see, that's how they understand the soil. Like that's, that is literally the state of the art for how we understand plasticity in soil, right? And that test is a representational apparatus. And that apparatus produces a particular kind of knowledge. And that knowledge is completely irrelevant to other disciplines. It's not even soil what they're doing, it's something else, right? So it's not a question of like getting better or worse representations. As soon as you start studying soil, you are in the hall of mirrors of claims about what is soil, what is not soil. Um, I was also struck by uh, the extent to which some things are just there's a known no a known unknown to the known <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of interest in in the unknowns right but in keeping them unknown right so I'm wondering if if and I'm wondering what the stakes of that unknowability are right so I mean it's kind of clear to me oh shoot, if we do a short foundation, a technical term, shadow foundation, shadow foundation, and we hit this, we're gonna to have to remediate this, it's gonna cost a lot of money. Or in reading your work, there's some, I, I didn't realize the extent to which this soil is financialized for insurance. It's very interesting, that relationship. Um, but I'm wondering, like, is there, you know, are you coming across in your work a kind of, there's a kind of negative unknowability here. We assume a kind of negativity that shows up in, in, in also in a kind of metaphors that emerge to apprehend this object. So I'm wondering if there is any room for some other way to understand this unknown. Are you coming across or in pursuing different kinds of representational strategies or in looking for different genres of apprehending the, the kinds of relations that soil brings us into that would not be overdetermined by these kinds of negative logics of debt or of remediation or even of toxicity, right? So um, because then it just makes me never want to touch the ground at all and hear yeah. this kind of stuff. So I'm wondering, you know, especially given the extent to which um, there's a kind of haptic quality running through a lot of your, your ideas too, like what is, you know, feel, and what's, what's the hands, the hands are here, and then what, what exceeds the diagram. Mm-hmm. So where do you, where is this energy? I don't want to, this is not an, an ask for the Pollyanna rendering of this, mm-hmm. right? But this is an ask for why, why do we, what do we make of this intense, like the, the negativity of this unknowability, right? That has been boxed and kept boxed for good reasons, right? The insurance company does not want to pay out for, Etc. Or you don't want to pay to remediate that. Yeah. It'll cost. It'll be cheaper just to run the deep foundation down. Where? What else is there? Like where else is that the excitement that your geotechnical engineer has? Where do we? Where else do we see that excitement? And what do you make of that as a different kind of way of engaging this this relational entity? Not. I'm sorry. That was not a question I planned to ask. <laughs> yeah. I I I really don't know because in my field of work, I depend on so many people. So it's from the university to the state to the like all of these people that are that they like all of them run in different priorities. Every one of them has a different priority. So throwing this other like unknowns into the table that they really don't want to know, it's really hard. Like it's just not something that they like the moment that so the moment that I create like it's like okay can I get authorized to run this test why uh-huh. and so then you kind of like run through the whole variables of why do you want to run that test and then so then as the moment in right now the moment of the project is like okay I need to run the test because I need to know the energy load of 
the, the, the blaze because it will save you money. Uh -huh. That's when it's like, yeah, sure, go. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the fact that I cannot find an engineer to do it is very strange. Like I, and Chicago is not a small city by any means. It's like I, I've been contacting like any type of like geothermal engineer, like geotechnical engineers to figure this out. Found one, one academic that wants to do the test, but he doesn't want, he doesn't have the machine to drill. <laughs> so I need to connect the dots. Um, but yeah, I, it's just the unknowns depending on who priority, who has the priority, or who has the money, the budget, or it's where it goes. So I, I'm assuming it's very similar to what happens in, in, in Mexico. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's, it's really similar. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in Mexico City, for, I'm, I've been really fascinated about how diatoms got, suddenly got, went, went absent from the entire um, concept of what soil was in a, in a geotechnical sense, because they're not supposed to be there. And um, I, mean, I, I mean, I think what this kind of gets at is a little bit about how um, we can't sort of rely on um, someone to completely decode soil for us. It actually depends on a set of practices that we build. And, and those practices are um, created in particular places and, and for particular reasons. And they can become quite, quite powerful. I mean, for me, the, the, the way in which the, the farmers in the Mezquital understood those soils came through a lot of, through generations of, of, of care, the labor of care. And even though it's a, it's a soil that would totally disgust us, um, they had their own particular practices for how to know and understand those risks, which were completely invisible to us, because when we want to understand this, well, we go to agronomists and geotechnical engineers. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's also really interesting how um, there's this kind of whole like invisible strata of soil care practices mm -hmm. that not a lot of people are talking about that aren't easy to find and to know, but always exist, um, and they're sophisticated. And they're, they're kind of a uh, kind of knowledge that's also sort of irreplaceable because um, if you think about how specific soil conditions can be, right, they're sort of non-transferable knowledges. And so there's, there's this kind of really interesting fight between a science of soil that would produce transferable knowledge or universal knowledge that would be applicable at, at everywhere and knowledge that would kind of remain local and irrelevant in other contexts. Um, Can you give us an example of what those practices involve? Yes, the, in the Mesquite Tunnel? Yeah, yeah sure. so, so like, um, I mean, for, for, for a lot of the um, uh, farmers, like they would um, only eat lunch in certain places wearing, you know, and it, that had uh, storage for, for like rubber boots and things like that. Or they would um, kind of um, only um, do certain things during the time in which they would flood irrigate their, their fields. When you, when you haven't flood irrigated your field, you can do things that you would not otherwise be able to do um, in such close proximity to the, to the wastewater. There's all kinds of sort of safety and, and kind of, um, and, and you know, conscious ways in which you understand like, okay, so then when, when you flood irrigate a field, what are the kind of um, implications of that saturation for when it's time to grow or when for it, when it's time to sow seeds and things like that? Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of um, ways in which um, you know how you grow something doesn't necessarily come with a, a manual, and to know how to do it in a particular area with a particular system. I mean, also every farmer has a different um, different access to the irrigation channel. Um, and that really, that really matters because actually uh, the longer the wastewater flows through a canal, the cleaner it gets because of actually it's, just like it's, it's not getting the sediment. That's right. Yeah. The sediment of the irrigation canals is actually cleaning the water. And when you test the water at the beginning of the irrigation system and at the end, it's not the same water. It's completely different. So there's also depends on knowing where you are in the irrigation system to know how careful you need to be. Um, yeah. It strikes me that, Cassie, that your question in a way um, points to the fact that soil science, the, the curiosity about soil, is motivated by this very unique 
assumption that soil will generate something, either because it's something that you grow, or because it will generate interest and and kinships and sudden relations. And that, in some ways, is derived from the very simplistic definition of the soil as a thing that grows things. And, and even in these very, very distant practices that are no longer about growing anything, that somehow remains the idea that if you dig here, then yeah, what you will get is not just a piece of information, but some kind of relational matrix out of which other things will grow, whether that's memories, whether that's you know, huh. revolutions, whether that's the wrong kind of project with debt as associated with it, et cetera. There's something about the yeah, the 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 soil as a kind of matrix for future problems yeah. or future something. Yeah. Um, that remains in these forms of representation. I mean not, I don't know, I'd have to ask Seth whether he intends, do you intend your drawings to be generative or do, to be records? I think they're archives. They're archives. They're archives. And um, I, I would like them to be generative <laughs> in the sense that um, maybe if we did understand all the things that the soil depends on, we could actually think of, a, of an alternative future that's better, maybe for everyone, but certainly better for a certain set of people who are, you know, want to have that political conversation. But right now, um, the, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't get into this in the amount of time that we had, but like the heavy metals continue to accumulate. Yeah. So if they keep farming, if they win against the wastewater treatment plant and they keep farming, they've passed that toxic burden on to future generations. That's not great. Um, and if they lose and the wastewater treatment plant um, prevails, then you know maybe all of that clean water that Mexico is going to producing is actually going to transform the entire valley into an industrial park. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so you know, and there's also this other uh, theory that actually water that has less organic matter might actually release the stored heavy metals that are yeah, there. Yeah. the legacy load of stored heavy metals, right? And 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 then it would really have to be an industrial park because you couldn't grow anything in that kind of toxic soup. Um, so, so then like is, is understanding more about all of these dependencies allow us to imagine a kind of third option and what would that third option be? And what would that third option option look like? Should we open it up? Cause it looks like there's some hands Any waving. Hands going up? Yes. One, two, okay, go. Right, sure. Yeah. 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 Thank you for the fantastic presentations. Um, Maybe a few thoughts and then send the actual question. But what was interesting for me was this connection or this metaphor that was mentioned at the beginning of so breaking ground, right? It's a very kind of strong act within the architectural discipline of breaking ground, okay. even if it's already quite broken, we learned today. Yeah. Um, and then also the connection between bodies and buildings or broken bodies, broken buildings to a certain degree, where on the one hand we have this connection within agriculture of the obsession with fertility that led to this infertility in bodies and soil. And then on the other hand, also with, with buildings, right? With all the um, kind of materials that go, not only in landfill, but also the way in which they are built. We're much more familiar with some cities like in London where all the construction sands, or 80% I think of the construction sands come actually from offshore dredging, uh, right? So you take part of that sediment, that sand from the ocean, from the Atlantic, that goes into building most of the corporate offices of the city, right? So you have this again, it's got more broken bodies into more broken buildings and so on and so on. And then also with, with geothermal energy that I'm no expert, but also there's a whole set, apparently a whole set of chemicals that go into the water that circulates uh, underground, that brings more chemicals out of the ground, turning the earth inside out again, like in Gabriel Hecht's um, train of thought. So I was, I was wondering about this kind of look of we have broken bodies, broken buildings, broken agriculture, broken architecture. Um, whether there is a sort of escape from that loop or a third option, as you were mentioning before. Um, is there a possibility of an outside at all? Or how do we embrace that kind of vicious loop of sorts? Um, yeah, I'm sure there's no answer to that <laughs> reflection. I mean, I, I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, I haven't thought about this systematically, but I'm struck by um, the extent to which there's been a dissemination of knowledge, usually from the extension to agricultural extension, right, to gardeners, right? It's fine, right? The only problem is just make sure you go up, right? Mm -hmm. Make sure you have that mulch, make sure you have a raised bed, right? And then don't worry. Or if you're a little worried, let's try the plants that sequester in the roots any kind of toxins, right? 
And yet, so people do that, right? But, and yet people also are committed to, to not doing that and to breaking the ground. And they, they will hear this kind of, these mantras, don't touch, don't eat, you know, dust, blah, blah, blah. And they just shrug at it, right? And so this is, I don't, it's not ignorance and it's not desperation. And so is it a third way in the, you know, not in the 1990s kind of welfare reform model, but like, you know, is, is there kind of a, there's this kind of active experimentation that is demanded if you've been working with this kind of material for several decades and you know the water and it's the soil that you have a way of working around. I mean, that is the only way that I can make sense of it as an anthropologist that people are actively experimenting with this unknown mm -hmm. as opposed to denying its existence sequestered, imagining it could be sequestered, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it can't be or, you know, so it's, but I don't know the nature of that experimentation and whether or not people are comfortable with that, right? To what extent are you comfortable wallowing a bit in the wastewater soil? I mean, but it seems to be that that has to be, that is, that's the only way, you know, through is through kind of situation. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I mean, I would agree. I think some of the people I work with have a kind of sobriety about the inability to undo toxicity or toxic touch. So there's a kind of in the same way that they have a sobriety about the, about the inability to become sovereign, politically sovereign, right? I think Martinique, they look at Haiti and they say, why would we be politically sovereign? What, <laughs> what sense does that make, right? There's no, there's no undoing the toxicity of the colonial relation. There's no undoing the toxicity of the place where we live. There's a kind of the broken bodies and the broken buildings that are going to persist. But the, uh, the question then becomes how, how do we make the best, the best life given the fact of this endurance. Um, it almost seems like, and this is very romanticized on my part. It's like, I was like, there's like hope for something. Like, yeah. like for a third option that is hopeless, like that has some hope of something that will come up. I think the most important is the acknowledgement of it. Like, so my first building, I didn't know that, I just didn't even talk to the geotechnic I died. It was just a factual. And now it's getting acknowledged. And now I'm passing this to the future generations. Because I, I think what happens is that we're not used to being on this, like so many layers of, of urban things happening under us. Like there was a house there, but now there's like 20 of them. Now we have to acknowledge them. I think not acknowledge. I think if there is one or two houses, you could just like shrug it and then keep going. But now that there's 20, you have to acknowledge. Not just because of the whole thing, but it, it has to, to do with like <clears throat> capitalism and colonialism. It's like it's gonna cost you money, which is sort of like how I get influenced all the time. So how can you start developing ways of that the design of the building actually thinks through what's on the soil and not just ignores it? Um, because that's design. That's like, like that's how you acknowledge the architecture of the design. Like you need to understand what their, their conditions are. You talk about the sun and you talk about the energy. And now we talk about how can we make like not depend on, on, on oil. So then you start talking about geotherma. So now we need to understand that the soil is as a factor that we need to talk more and more. Um, that we've been ignoring and just leaving to the engineers to do it. Now it's all part. And now you're jealously wanting to take part in the breaking ground. I think, Cassie, you're right. There's a kind of, we have to do what I think of when I think that as someone who studied regimes of historicity or regimes of, you know, the classic pronouncement is that we are now in a presentist moment. Nobody has historical curiosity, but not so at all. On the contrary, you're right. That there's people are fighting over the, who gets to be the person who discovers what's actually, what our soil is actually made of, not just what it remembers for specific things, but it's kind of, it's a form of historicity. It's a form of temporal curiosity, I think, but just a very materialist version of it, rather than one that's about the archeological imagination or, you know, what previous civilizations were there. So you have a question, and you have, but you were first, so go for it. Oh, okay. Um, thanks, that was really interesting for everyone. Um, so I come from a post-colonial perspective and I found the parallels really interesting actually, um, particularly around the way we approach things theoretically. Um, so the problem that we have with post-colonial studies is that while looking at colonial legacies and trying to understand the impact that that has on producing 
the kind of post-colonial body, whether that's corporeal or cadastral or chemical. Um, the problem with that excavation many times is the fact that we then constitute and construct and define those bodies simply through the colonial and we end up reproducing that colonial gaze. Um, so the work is still important, but it's also reproductive. And so my question to you guys was, how are you dealing with what seems to be emerging as the built gaze and how you are kind of constructing the soil through all of these built encounters, whether it's the wood chip or whether it's the affluence or whether it's the pesticide or whether it's the de demolished houses. How are you then grappling with what's emerging as the built gaze and how can you, how can we think about the soil and its, I guess, intransigent or or complicit or mediative capacity that's outside of and not just a part of the way the soil has been colonized. Mm -hmm. The built gains actually. No, no, it just came out of nowhere. Oh, it's that like, boom. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a big question. Yeah, no, um, I <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, this is not my wheelhouse, so I don't even know. Um, I don't even think I understand the orders of apprehension that are at play, even in the, the war of different academies of soil science and all those sorts of stuff. I mean, I, I guess like the first question I would ask would be maybe from like a practical standpoint, um, why would, if, if these kinds of ways of apprehending any kind of substance, right, doesn't have to necessarily be soil, right, um, have so structured a geography such that one has to inhabit it, right, and one has to thrive or not within it, right, what would be the practical value of, an, of, of insisting on an outside to that? Or um, if, if there is a whole sort of ge geography in place that has already nailed down these ways of understanding um, these places and producing value on them and only asking about the first six inches or whatever it is, right? So, I mean, I guess what strikes me about the people that I talk to who garden anyway, and what is, you know, I mean, it's it's Phil, there's, you can see like bathtubs and stuff, right? Um, is that they are, they are just, they are just not looking for an outside per se, right? And I think, and I don't know if it's because the substance, I don't really know why. Perhaps it's because it's so ubiquitous, this practice, that it's hard to imagine any kind of containment um, and, and perhaps any other outside to this than the world that we have now and then what to do with this here as opposed to imagine a different kind of game. And yet, you know, I have to say, like one of the reasons that I thought a lot about this is because I went to the field um, and attempted, attempted to do field work with a toddler. Um, which I thought was going to be swimmingly straightforward, and it was none of those things, right? Um, and it was very interesting to watch this, you know, now she's six, but the time she was two, um, just engage a landscape that I hadn't, that I had rushed over for years and not thought about, right? You know, I know how to get from A to B because there's all these desire lines cut in the lots, you go this way and that way, you just, this is the fastest way, right? There are all these vacant lots. And it was interesting to see what she noticed, right? And what kinds of things she took pleasure in touching and pull. I mean, in some ways it's a nightmare, but in other ways it's really interesting because it suggests a different way of engaging stuff that is completely unsocialized into the idea of this being um, something already regimented either by science or by you know insurance or by anxiety about you know my kid my kid's going to grow a horn or something if she touches it. Um, and I was like, huh, I wonder if that is kind of this like radical vulnerability out of which a different kind of gaze could emerge. I mean, does it need to be an unsocialized small child? I, I don't know, but it was very interesting to watch and very perplexing, right? To see what she was drawn to and what she wanted to assemble and what she wanted to sort and the kinds of things that she put together of this kind of collection of, of, of tile and flag and paint chips. You know, of course I took the paint chips away from her. I, I do know that, right? <laughs> but, but, the, but that kind of question of sorting because it's such heterogene heterogeneous stuff, mm. right? She the probably question, loved it. She was probably like, this, this. Oh, she did love it, right? So then the question is like, is that in that sorting, is there something really interesting as a kind of initial practical ge gesture? Like what is it, if it's not gonna be the colonial gaze, it's not gonna be the built gaze, then just like some, the, the, the move to sort or to organize is human, right? So what will, be the sorting mechanisms? Could you experiment with what they would be depending on the incoherence of the substances? I don't know actually, but it was 
really inspiring and terrifying at the same time to watch someone start to sort of move through this. But is it just human though? Because I, I, I was struck by when he said, um, how can the different ways in which people think about the soil and how can we understand the soil? But and I hate to come from this kind of cliche post-humanist trope, but yeah. are we going to wonder how the soil understands itself? Is there is there another way that we can come from this? I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's all coming from a very top-down place. Mm. I mean, yeah, I, I, that would take us into a discussion of what we understand the kind of analytical value of the post-human move to be. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to go out on a limb and say, say something, you know, that I haven't sorted through in my head. I guess I always come down on, I don't have access to a non-human perspective. And, and yet what I do have access to is imagining to the range of relations that could be possible with the human interpretant at the center of it. I don't know, I mean, that's, that's maybe anthrocentric in some ways, but that is where I come. So then I'm like, well, maybe, maybe to start with the, the map of the relations and to understand that of course, there must be interest involved, right? Because if you have a kind of um, awareness that um, that somehow the microbiome is being affected by these practices, or whatever it is, then there would be a kind of interest and kind of top-down interest in understanding this relationality. But I'm not quite sure where else to go as an anthropologist that wouldn't be speculative. And speculative is fine. I think Seth those has depicted a drawing which was not meant to be read. You know, it's very graphically legible of some kind of agency some and then you the way you describe you have to talk about it I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we suddenly saw basically a certain kind of not toxicity actually an immunity mm -hmm. <laughs> to disease developing inside the soil that's a pretty non-human i mean it's human originated mm -hmm. and if it's nafta so you said nafta but then you showed these kind of non-human things developing in the soil that's pretty close to a post human sort of perspective but yeah, perspective yeah, yeah. with depiction. Yeah, but but I mean, I also want to say that some of the great like post-colonial theorists were soil scientists and and believed in like the power of soil science to transform uh, social relations in post-colonial contexts. And I mean, it doesn't have to be like anything more than saying like actually this particular soil is like a capitalist soil. This particular soil creates dependence, and this particular soil. Um, creates dependence in these kinds of ways. And if we want to decolonize um, a nation, you would also actually have to start to decolonize the soil. And that might be as simple as thinking about the relationship between um, soil moisture and, and tree cover. You know, at a, certain, at a certain threshold of soil moisture, you can grow things and be autonomous. If, if you fall below that threshold of soil moisture, you cannot. So you could think of even just like simple relationships like that as potentially quite powerful in, in post-colonial context of thinking about like what is the soil that's going to produce autonomy instead of uh, bondage or, or, or autonomy and, and, and self-sufficiency in ways that are new and novel and not um, based on um, capitalist relations and, and, and a colonial context. I mean, I think, yeah. So one last question, we have six minutes and then we'll have done a good two hours with you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, thank you so much. And also thank you for the question. And one of the things that like was really interesting to me, I think, is the question of like agency and kind of this political impasse, right? That we're, I think, in many ways, kind of all of the presentations are invoking um, in one way or another. And and I think here it's also at the metaphor also of, like what the soil grows, where I think how can we also think about how soil is grown? And the fact that soil is something, as it, as it was mentioned, right, that has a lot of care practices and a very long history of care practices. And in like recent studies, like with David Berber and Wengro, David Wengro with the Dawn of Everything, right, how all of these like early formations of societies came together because they were growing soil that then would enable to grow fertility. And, and I think it, this is kind of our, the work of Paolo Tavares, right? That talks about how in the kind of forest ruin, right? We see the architecture of how the Amazon today, like how this biggest rainforest 
is construct is a constructed like habitat, is a constructed ecology that developed like over thousands and thousands of years. And I think if how they, and I think especially it says, you know, like when we find these kind of moments of kind of political impasse, these moments of crisis, of like breakdown, how are we, and especially I think like, and Vanessa, you talk about like so beautifully, right? This kind of toxic kin, the fact that in many ways, what we can see today, like the toxicity, and this is very much indebted to the work of Hannah Landaker, right? In the, in the history of like epigenetics and metabolism, the fact that toxicity today is kind of so pre prevalent is that Toxicity is what is kind of growing us. We are moving through toxicity rather than toxicity moving through us. Yeah. So then it's like, if all of, you know, there's, how are we kind of, or what are the possibilities of kind of flipping the order or kind of going back to kind of another order where kind of these care practices are really kind of being back embedded in order to think, and can we through that kind of start thinking about how we build new formations of like actions, of like alliances, of kind of political agency, right? To kind of really kind of implant kind of for future generations, kind of a, a certain soil that will be fertile again. It will be very different fertility. It will be kind of full of this kind of post-colonial, post-toxic, post-industrial kind of soil, but it will be built again. Right, and again, like how do we build the environments once again? Anybody have any thoughts on how to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Parting thoughts on how to build, rebuild a fertile soil by planting it with uh, political will, let's say. I mean, I, part of what I've been trying to think about, and thank you all for your questions, is how how we might think this future without insisting upon the post, right? Like I think part of what Martinique offers for me is to be able to think through an enduring form of coloniality that never gets to the post, that never gets to the, you know. And so that the, the, and the way that the synthetic chemical does that for me is it kind of jumps the shark of what its planners think it's gonna do, right? Uh, there's this sense of a chemical that can be bounded in place and time, uh, that can have a certain set of causal effects that can do a certain kind of work in the ground that will not then touch everything around it, but of course it does. And that the only way to un not even un to reckon with its effects is to redistribute its effects mm -hmm. rather than try to undo them. And I think the, the for, for the folks that I work with and the, the worlds that I think they're trying to build, the only solution is a redistributive one rather than a, an undoing or um, remaking one. It is, it is reckoning with what is before us and trying uh, kind of to radically move the burden, um, uh, to, to diagnose the burden uh, soberly and then to move it in a way that seems kind of more equitable. Uh, for the worlds that we're trying to be in um, and to evolve. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. I think we can make that the last parting comment. And I really want to thank the audience and also thank you. So, Linda, Vanessa, Seth, and Cassie, thank you so much for making this. <laughs>